Hey everybody, what is up? Jacob back here with you and today I'm going to be showing you my new cello pedal board. I did a video a couple months ago about some of the mistakes that I made uh, in creating my last pedal board and a lot of you guys commented that you wanted to see uh, what improvements I had made and what I'm using now. So this video is going to be for you guys. Now what I didn't want to do in this video and what I don't want to do in any of my videos is just to repeat information that you could easily find elsewhere online. There are so many great uh, guitarists that are making videos, you know, reviewing every pedal under the sun and I'm actually going to uh, give a few shout outs to some of my favorites. Um, and there's also a lot of great reviews uh, for every single pedal board a related product that could possibly be out there. And I'm going to be giving some shout outs as well to some of the people that are doing those types of reviews. Even though, of course, I'm going to be showing you all of the pedals that I'm using now and why I chose them, I want this video to not be about specific products or brands. Uh, I wanted it to be evergreen. In other words, to give you tips, tricks, and tactics that you can take with you in creating a board that really suits your needs. So my first big tip right off the bat is don't build a pedal board, at least if you can get away with it. The truth is 98% of you watching this video and 99% of the string players out there would be much better served with a multi-effects box. Now, if you play more rock and you're using a lot of, you know, you know, overdrive and gain and wah and those types of things, I'm talking about boxes, you know, that are made by Boss and Line 6, all the guitar processors. So I would start with a cheap and easy unit by Moore, Joyo. I really am a big fan of and have always been of the Boss ME80. Um, this unit has all of the standard effects that we need to know and to learn about um, and still offers us the convenience of knobs so that we're not going through menus, which is kind of a turn off when you're first learning about gear. Um, it also is battery powered and the sounds are fine. As a matter of fact, a lot of those overly compressed boss drives and uh, delay sounds work exceptionally well for bowed strings. And I've seen players like, you know, Christian House use uh, that unit for years and years, and it works great for him. And he sounds totally professional on stage. Or like two cellos who I interviewed, and Luca told me that they are just using a TC Nova system, which is, you know, a very old guitar processor that's been around for 11 or 12 years at least now, and that you can get on eBay for 100 bucks. Same deal, just a couple of knobs, easy to tweak, and they're playing arenas and touring the world with that bar. And if you're basically an acoustic player, that might be just a simple, all-in-one preamp DI, which will just give you your boost, your your mute, your mute, mute, your mute, maybe a tuner, and we've got a giant shootout of those. You can hear how they sound and do a feature comparison on the pickuptest.com. There's even a lot of multi-effects DI boxes now for acoustic players designed by all of the usual suspects from Boss to Moore to uh, Joyo that combine a preamp DI with a few of the most basic reverbs and um, delays for those of you who still need a very, very bare bones setup and don't want to travel with an amp, which usually gives you some of those effects. The truth is, is that once you decide to go with a multi-pedal rig, every pedal you add creates more cost, takes up more space and creates all kinds of other levels of complexity and things that can go wrong on stage from power supply issues to cabling and creates more and more of a hassle for you on stage. Do single pedals sound better than multi-effects boxes? Probably not. A lot of it is a matter of marketing hype and until you've really played hundreds of shows amplified in whatever setting you're trying to design your effects and your gear around, you really don't know what you even need. It's better to just go with a multi-effects box where it's one plug, one power supply plugging in, and you're ready to play on stage. In this case, I would highly recommend that you go cheap. Don't buy into the marketing hype. Most of these boxes were designed and voiced for guitars or bass players anyway, so 
for us, we're really starting with a blank slate whenever we use a lot of these effects boxes and are going to need to learn how to use EQ and how to actually play these effects in a way where we'll get real musical results with the bow. And that only happens through practice and tweaking the knobs and looping yourself or recording yourself and listening back. And this is a process that you just can't skip over. It's learning how to really use your gear in depth. I've seen so many string players come into gigs with fancy pedal boards or even, you know, giant multi-effects rigs, you know, like the, the, the full-on Helix unit by Line 6, you know, or Kempers, and they barely know how to dial in a reverb. You know, they haven't taken the time to really hear and get an idea for what those knobs do and how you can tweak them on stage and in a live situation. And this is really gonna be true for most of you guys watching. So I would start with something cheap that you can break, that's easy to use, and that just has all of the effects kind of built into it. So before you buy into the marketing hype that you need a bunch of hand-painted, boutique-quality, single-function uh, pedals uh, to sound good or to look cool on stage or to be legit, think again. So I'm sure a lot of you guys are wondering at this point, well, Jacob, why aren't you using that? Well, to be honest with you, up till about, I don't know, maybe two years ago, I was going that route. I was using uh, a Helix uh, by Line 6, uh, their flagship unit, um, and I was one of the first uh, musicians on the West Coast to have one of those, and I was testing it, and I loved it. I especially liked that I could blend my pickup with my microphone, which was a huge part of my sound at that time. I needed some of the realism and air of a microphone with my, the punch of the pickup, especially when I was using effects or playing uh, plucked and I thought that the Helix was perfect because it allowed me to create different sounds that had different blends of those two things, which made it a really, really unique uh, kind of unit and a unique functionality at, for me at that time. It was almost like having the flexibility of a studio on stage. My only real issue with the Helix was that it was giant and pretty heavy, and I wasn't particularly inspired by a lot of the ambient effects, the delays and the reverbs, which are obviously at the core of what a lot of us do as string players, right? Kind of at the center of our basic tone. But I was going along fine with the Helix for quite a while until I discovered the Tone Dexter. Now, several of our most popular videos on electric string player, including the most important video you'll ever watch, and the key to electric tone are actually all about that unit and me demoing it. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about the Tone Dexter right now, but suffice it to say, what made it a game changer for me is that it allowed me to not have to deal with blending the mic and the pickup. Every time you have to blend, you're dealing with the deficiencies of both types of amplification. In other words, when you're using a mic, there's still possibilities for feedback and bleed, right, with the effects. And also, blending them meant that, you're, that I was dealing with two channels in my Helix, which meant programming and coming up with new effects tedious. And, of course, I was dealing with multiple cables. The, the Tone Dexter allowed me to just use a pickup, which drastically simplified my rig and made me a lot lighter the problem then became that if I was gonna use the Tone Dexter with the Helix, I would have had to have had a pedal board the size of Rhode Island. And of course, there were serious weight issues there as well. And this leads me to my second tip, which is to have your priorities in place. You know, after you've played 100 shows or so as an amplified string player and you've toured with your rig, you start to learn what aspects of your board and of the effects that you're using actually make you happy and are actually useful and which ones aren't as useful. And for me, one of the biggest things that I've learned is that size is as important as any other factor in figuring out what pedals I'm using and what my board is going to be like. So as someone who travels, I needed a rig that would fit on an airplane. So according to most TSA specs, that means that it probably can't be longer than about 20 inches and taller than about 10 or 12. 
and I didn't want to have multiple rigs for multiple groups. I wanted to master my pedal board and the pedal board layout just like I've hopefully mastered my instrument and my fingerboard and have that in place whether I'm in the studio, whether I'm doing a stadium tour, or whether I'm doing a local gig at a club. If you watched the previous pedal board video, you know I talked a lot about ergonomics as a cellist and the window of opportunity. In other words, what's easily reachable with our right foot when our heel is down. It's a pretty small amount of real estate we have to work with to select all of our sounds. Finally, I wanted to make sure that everything in my rig was very, very easy to use, user-friendly, so that if I'm stressed out on a stage and we've got two minutes for sound check and I need to completely dial in a different reverb that isn't working, for example, I wouldn't have any issues there. So now that I had my priorities in place, I was determined to get out on the road and make mistakes. That is, I knew that no matter how careful I was about selecting my gear, there were going to be certain things that just didn't work, whether it was a matter of playing well with the other pedals I had, or working for my performance style, or that just didn't fit for whatever reason. And I wasn't going to learn that by thinking about it, right? It was, I was only going to learn by getting experience. So I wanted to start as simple and as small as possible. So when we're building a component-based rig, one of the most important things is to try to keep things as simple as possible if we possibly can. So to start off the rig, I began with the Tone Dexter, which is not only the core of my sound, but is a, basically a Swiss Army knife that allows me to do the basic things that I need to do on stage. I can turn it into a tuner, and I can mute myself. I can use it as a DI, and go directly to my amp. And I have enough blending and tonal options to really give me most of what I need in any standalone acoustic gig. This would include, you know, gypsy jazz or playing in a classical string quartet um, or even a jazz string quartet, any type of acoustic situation. To make things even better, the Tone Dexter gives me a boost and different levels of volume control using the bypass. Check out a separate video I did for that in my three Tone Dexter tips. Additionally, I don't even really need a reverb pedal because if I create wave maps with the microphone a little further away, I can give a simulation of a room sound that's just usable enough, and so I don't even have to worry about bringing a reverb pedal along, which means I can eliminate that extra cabling and an extra power supply and a bunch of extra variables that could go wrong. The one thing I found myself really needing, though, with the Tone Dexter was one of these guys, a volume pedal. Now, this is a volume pedal I use quite a lot, the Dunlop X-Mini, and it's super cool because it can also be an expression pedal, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But the one that I chose to go with for the very first iteration of my rig was the Ernie Ball MVP. Now this is a little bit different from the standard Ernie Ball volume pedal in that it's a passive pedal. And without getting too technical about this, what you need to know is that most volume pedals that are passive will suck a lot of the high-end tone out of your signal. In other words, they change and color your sound in kind of a weird way. This Ernie Ball has a built-in buffer and it can be powered or just using a nine volt so you don't have to schlog an extra power supply or plug anything else in. And this lasts a good long time. The feel and the build quality is really exceptional on this. Uh, these last for years and years and years and years. Although if you want to go crazy with it, there are some mods available online from different companies where they'll replace the string and make it even more reinforced uh, with the Kevlar string and things like that. What I also love about this particular volume pedal is that there is a minimum volume. Now, why is a minimum volume so great for us? Well, if you're trying to uh, just have a basic pits level and an arco level, for example, for you cellists that you know do a lot of finger work, you can set the bottom of this pedal. And the advantage of a volume pedal here, as opposed to say, you know, just the boost switch, is that if you're playing in those quieter acoustic situations, check this out. That's right, these aren't soft switches. You're gonna get a loud click every time you change. 
And also, while the tone dexter is pretty fast, you may get an occasional, very quick uh, popping sound just in the in the in the circuitry and uh, changing of the tones. So there's a little bit of an acoustic click, and sometimes with the tone dexter, although it's acceptable most of the time, uh, there's there's a, a change that you can actually hear in your signal. Now this volume pedal allows you, as you can hear, there's no click there. That's nice and smooth, and so you can easily go from toe to heel position and get your minimum and maximum volume. This is really similar to uh, the classic Mark Summer rig that he used with Turtle Island, and if you want to hear about him talking about that rig, you can check out the interview we did on the pickuptest.com, but essentially Mark's rig was uh, a nice microphone. Um, I believe he was using a crown mic that's not available anymore, but it's, he was using a miniature microphone, and then he would use uh, a preamp, just a simple uh, LR bags. I'm substituting it with this because boy, you can get a lot more out of a tone dexter, uh, but it's still acting as a preamp. And then he would use the volume pedal to bring in as much of his pickup sound as he needed, essentially to turn on his pickup uh, when he was doing his finger work and his plucking, relying on the mic mostly for um, mostly for bowed work. But between the faux reverb and realistic body sound you can get from the tone dexter and a volume pedal like this, this is definitely a major upgrade in a lot of ways uh, to Mark's rig because you don't have to deal with a microphone, you're just running a pickup so it's just one signal in, easy peasy with the Ernie Ball. So you could, you're just running one signal in instead of the two that Mark was using, and you're adjusting the volume with the Ernie Ball. So the first iteration, bare bones version of my board, looked like this. We have in turn a Line 6 Helix HX Stomp, a tone dexter and the pitchfork by electro harmonics and it's mounted to an old pedal train mini uh nowadays uh pedal train calls it uh, a metro metro 20. Um, and uh, the power supply is the new chalks uh eventide power max um, and this thing is a beast. Let's talk about each of these pedals in turn and most importantly why I chose them because I want to get you inside of my thought process here. Once again, quick reminder, I am not sponsored by any of these companies and I did not take any money from any of these companies. Okay, first off, the Tone Dexter, that was uh, a no-brainer um, for the reasons that uh, we've already talked about. And it, the smaller the board is, the more I can appreciate some of the flexible options of the Tone Dexter. I think it's the ultimate preamp DI box, uh, and it does things for your sound that no analog preamp DI box could possibly do. A really, really cool unit. If you want to know a little bit more about the Tone Dexter, again, there's videos to check out, and uh, we're, we've also released uh, three tips uh, for using IRs with bowed strings. It'll give you some ideas about how to really dial in your sound with this thing. Okay, next, the Pitchfork by Electro Harmonics. Now, if you've watched our Octave or Blowout series, uh, you've gotten to hear this unit, you've heard it shot out with a lot of other um, Octavers on the market. Now, Electro Harmonics uses two different Octave uh, algorithms in some of their units, and uh, the Pitchfork uses one, and there's another Octave algorithm that uh, is in... Um, the Micropog, I believe, uh, and some people prefer that algorithm. Um, I've tried a Micropog, and I also have the original Moor Tender Octaver Mark I, which is a really fun pedal uh, that was a direct ripoff of that pedal, and I still prefer the Pitchfork. Uh, the Pitchfork is also unbeatable for all of the different things it can do and its versatility, so if you need more than just an octave down, which I don't, um, the Pitchfork is uh, still the best choice, I believe. Now, let's talk about the Helix HX Stomp. Now, I have owned every version of the Helix, um, and this pedal to me is just completely badass. Um, this 
when I saw this pedal had come out uh, after I'd gotten the HX effects, I immediately sold the HX effects and bought this. Um, it is so incredibly versatile. Again, it gives me the options that I need to have a brain um, built into my system. And once you're talking about having extra effects outside of just, say, a tone dexter or a preamp, you really want to start thinking about what is going to be the brain of your unit. And what I mean by brain is, is that this is not only an effects processor unto itself, but it also has built-in loops and MIDI so it can control multiple other effects on your pedal. And one of the, the things that I like the most about this, and by the way, there are a million great reviews for this online, so I'm not going to go in too much to all of the things it can do. Uh, just check out, you know, Pete Thorne or uh, any of the millions of great, I'll, I'll, I'll link some reviews to this uh, below uh, for all of the features. But as a string player, and as someone who's building their board from the ground up, one thing I loved about this is the two effects loops that are completely controllable. So what that, what that does is it allows this line six to completely open up the possibilities for the other two units on this board. What do I mean by that? Well, um, because the amount of send and return is controllable, it's almost like having a dry, wet control for each of these uh, that can be different for every preset. So for example, on some of my octave patches, if I'm playing with a bow and there's some, you know, I'm doing funk or something like that, I want that octave to be really present and fat. So I can leave the mix 100% up on the pitchfork and have a preset that only takes about 40 to 50% pitchfork in here. If I'm doing a subtle pizzicato thing, I might only want maybe 15 to 20% of the octave, just a little bit of almost imperceptible extra fatness uh, and bottom uh, added to my low end. So I can have a pits patch that has totally different compression, EQ, reverb settings, and just gives me 15% of the pitchfork, all without having to bend down and turn knobs. Because you know as a cellist, bending down and turning knobs, particularly if it's not in between songs, if it's during a song, Frickin' sucks, right? Uh, you knock your uh, bridge into the your music stand, and you know, or you know, you you start to feedback your mic accidentally because you moved your cello too close to the monitor. So many things can happen. You don't want to be bending over, making any adjustments while you're on stage. And I, I'm going to be talking a lot about that a little bit later on, but certainly not mid-song. Um, now, this effects loop also opens up a lot of things with the Tone Dexter. I talked in uh, the Tone Dexter shootout and also in the uh, the Three Tips video about blending and how I an IR, which the Tone Dexter is using with its wave maps, um, can really help to get rid of that piezo quack, but sometimes that can dull out your sound a little bit too much, and you can lose the punchiness you need. For example, sometimes with my pizzicato patches, or a lot of the time, I want like a very punchy direct sound, something much more like uh, the pickup gives me. And then a lot of the time when I'm bowing, I want something that has a lot more air in the tone, something w with a lot more IR. And with that blend control from the effects, from the second effects loop, I can have patches that give me exactly that, that give me 80% IR, 20% pickup, and then I can switch to a pizzicato patch and instantly, again, have totally different reverb, compression, any setting you want, but then also have way more of that uh, natural, original, punchy pickup sound in my tone. So the Helix allows me to totally open up all of the possibilities with its analog effects loops. And then of course it has MIDI, uh, which is you know fantastic because if I'm going to expand this rig further, and I did, we'll talk about the next version of this rig uh, in the next video. So the Tone Dexter was the core of my always on sound. The Pitchfork was probably the effect that I used the most. And even though the Line 6 has a decent octaver in it, there's really nothing on the market that tracks as well or sounds as good as the electroharmonic stuff in this category. And finally, the Helix allows me to control both of these other pedals in much more musical and creative ways, and gives me an entire suite of extra effects while setting up my headphone monitoring. 
and unlike the HX effects, works as a USB interface. So I knew that if I wanted to expand to using uh, my laptop for some of the Ableton stuff that I do, or using any type of laptop-based effects, I could easily integrate that into my rig through the Helix. So it was really not only a brain, but the Swiss Army knife I knew that I would always be able to use to expand my rig in any other way that I wanted to. The one thing that I, I think sucks about the Helix and a lot of the Line 6 products, and it's a small complaint, is the power supply. The power supplies that come with the Line 6 are these giant, ridiculous bricks. Um, and, um, and they don't fit well under any flat pedal boards or even really on a power strip. Now, you can go into forums about this with Helix users bitching about it. Um, but... What I've found is that I can use this Chox because this Chox is so high current. Um, it's 680 milliamps per 9 volts and switchable from 9 to 12 to 15 to 18. It's really the most versatile power supply in the history of mankind and also only an inch tall, a total marvel. Um, I can combine two outputs and they make a special yellow adapter to do that. And now I can run my Helix with no problems at all. Once you get into multiple pedals, you need a power supply that's versatile. And I went overboard with this, uh, with this particular one, this Chalks uh, Eventide Power Max, because I knew there may be some other pedals that I might be adding later. And I'm going to show you that second iteration of the pedal board and why I added them in just a second. My only complaint with the Chalks is that their power plugs are mounted via what looks like an RCA connection. And that can be a little bit of a bummer if you're trying to make custom power cables and customize the length. Most of the great kits that are out there that'll work with standard power supplies will not work with the Chalks. That said, uh, Chalks does include a lot of different lengths in their stock kit and you can order uh, different ones from the company. And Paul Chalks, who I actually got to meet uh, at NAMM this year, is an unbelievably cool guy and they really do a great job and the quality is just completely spectacular. This is by far the most noise-free and versatile power supply that I've ever seen and I've owned the Strymon power supplies and pretty much all of the other ones that are out there on the market as well. So that's really saying something. Now let's talk about the board and cabling. Now this is the type of thing that may seem kind of geeky, but these choices are really, really important and it's stuff that you need to know about and consider when you're putting your board together. And this is why you shouldn't build a board like this or like the one I'm about to show you until you've really, really paid your dues with a multi-effects processor and convinced yourself that keeping it simple was just not going to work for you. So the board I'm using is a Pedal Train Mini, as I said, and now Pedal Train is uh, calling this the, uh, the Metro. Um, and they have a Metro 16, a Metro 20, and a Metro 24, but I wanted to go with the 20 inch because if I'm getting over 20 inches, there could be some issues with uh, the TSA, and I wanted to be able to put this overhead. Now, one of the advantages to this board is that it's relatively flat. As you can see here, it's about an inch tall, although with the feet, it's a little bit more than an inch. And as I mentioned in the pedal board build video before because we're, we have to keep our heel up as we stomp on these effects, every little bit really does make a difference. If I was going to be sticking with this board instead of just using it as a prototype, which I'm doing or which I did, um, I would probably have gone with a much, much flatter board, maybe something from Stomping Grounds, uh, which is a company based in Georgia, and they make beautiful pedal boards, I'm gonna show you one in just a minute, um, that uh, are about as short and close to playing on the floor as you will find. Be aware though that if you have a flat board, you need to figure out where you're mounting your power supply, and it can also make it more difficult for you uh, to figure out cable routing. In other words, if your cable routing isn't clean and neat, 
it's really, really difficult to plan things just going over the top of the board. So if you're not super ADD uh, and into that type of thing, um, it is good to have a channel where you can keep your cabling and keep your power supply underneath. A little bit of a trade-off there. But this seemed like a good compromise for now as I've really been focusing on avoiding any type of angled boards for the reasons that we talked about before. And last but not least, I threw this together with a couple of custom-made patch cables that I already had that used Carnare cabling. And patch cables are extremely important, uh, and the jacks you're using as well. There's a lot of great videos about uh, testing different patch cables and what the differences are, and there's one in particular that really goes completely completely overboard, and I'm going to put a link to that below. There are a lot of opinions about solderless cables, but in my experience, using solderless cables are generally a recipe for disaster. They're just not as dependable if you're going to be doing a lot of touring because that connection is always going to be a little bit uh, exposed. Also, because I'm using an effects loop, which is going to be a common occurrence for a lot of you guys, I needed a split cable that would be custom length. So I ordered it online from Doc's Basement in New York City. This is a great company. They also do some audio production, but they will send you custom cables uh, that they've soldered themselves uh, using uh, Megami wire with any type of jack you can imagine. And they send it really fast, they do great work, and they are extremely reasonably priced. So I've ordered several cables from them, never had a problem with the cables. They were always really high quality. And I'm gonna uh, put a link to them below if you're uh, looking to do some custom cabling or you're not a soldering wizard the way I'm not. Um, I found them to be excellent. After playing with this rig for a while, I started wanting to have access to more sounds on stage. Don't get me wrong, it worked for about 70% of my gigs, especially using the functionality of the Tone Dexter for a mute and tuner, and using all three of the foot switches on the Helix to dial up different presets. My first move was to add on a foot switcher, which the Helix allows you to do to scroll between different banks. and to add one more preset. And I use the Boss Dual Foot Switch FS7. I would just attach this and leave it on the floor next to my board. And as this thing is super portable and doesn't need a power supply, I was able to just chuck it in the pedal board bag and I just needed to plug a stereo cable in so setup was a breeze. This kept me happy for a while and I was really thinking that it might be the final version of my rig. I was thrilled to have something so small and simple. But as I started revisiting some of my ambient projects, including my solo cello work, I realized that I needed access to more presets, especially when it came to dialing in more exotic delays and reverbs and being able to control them. At that time, I knew it was time to add some MIDI. And because I had the Helix as my brain, I could use that MIDI control to continue to control the analog pitchfork and the Tone Dexter as I had been, but it would allow me to call up and control a lot more presets with the Helix. A lot of the time we think about adding extra effects when we really, when it's a much better value to be able, especially if you have a MIDI based rig, to be able to invest more in controllers to get the most out of what you already have. My first call was the Keith McMillan Soft Step 2. This is a controller that I've used for quite a while, probably since it came out, and, and there are things that I love and hate about this unit. I love the portability. Again, because it's so lightweight and so thin, I can fit it in my backpack or a gym bag or anything else, and I can mount it off of my board. So again, it doesn't take up any extra space. The other thing I love about it is the versatility. Each one of these pedals can become, or each one of these switches, I should say, can serve multiple functions. So instead of just having preset one, two, three, four, five, I can 
turn one of these pedals into an expression pedal where pressing harder on the lower half or the upper half can almost act as a volume slider or an expression slider to control any parameter. So for example, if I want a reverb to get wetter uh, and more lush and spacious, I can do that and control it in really finite ways. It also allows me to assign multiple functions to a single foot switch. And that is super, super handy because, for example, if I want one to be my bowed sound with a stomp, I can double tap one and then it becomes my pit sound, right? And that can have totally different, again, EQ, compression, uh, blending of the IR settings, all of that, and I can control and that allows me and that allows me to get a lot more bang for my buck when it comes to the real estate that my foot can cover and i barely have to lift my foot to even access the back row of pedals so ergonomically speaking that is incredible last but not least i love the fact that i could run a long usb cable and leave even my sparse pedal board off stage this was great for acoustic groups and chamber music groups where I just had one or two presets I was using and the switching is also completely silent. There's no clicks, no pops, so it really played well uh, in chamber music situations. Now let's talk about some of the things I really don't like about this unit. First of all, because of the nature of these switches, it's not always consistent, especially if you have this on carpet or a softer surface. Sometimes I would try to hit the switch and nothing would happen. And I wasn't quite sure what was going on. The learning curve for this unit is extreme, probably as high as any MIDI controller I've ever seen. And the documentation for the soft step is terrible. The customer support is also pretty average to below average if you have any questions about the unit. And there's not a lot of YouTube videos about the soft step either, so for some reason they really haven't built a large community around a product that is really revolutionary and unique. There's also a big issue powering the soft step. Now this is made to plug right into your USB jack on a computer. But what happens if you're trying to use the soft step as a standalone MIDI controller without being plugged into a laptop? Well, the company offers this MIDI expander unit. And this is very small and very light and was pretty easy to fit onto my pedal board without causing too much of an issue. The only problem is, is that the power supply here is a USB power supply. So you need a USB based power port to power it. The company gives you a USB to AC plug, but of course I don't have any kind of power strip and didn't want to be dealing with plugging in multiple power strips. That can be a real pain in the ass on stage and slow down setup time. And it also adds another variable that I just didn't want to deal with. And I found two solutions to this. The first one is called the USB Porter, and it takes 9 volts of power from any regular power supply and distributes it. It even comes with two little lights so you can light up your pedal board on dark stages, and I think that was generally the idea of the Porter, to be a light source and perhaps a charger for cell phones and laptops. And for those of you that use laptops, that's a very handy thing as well. But for me, because I just wanted the USB to power this little unit, and because I didn't want to add even an extra small pedal to do the job, which is one of the reasons why I chose the Power Max, which is the only power supply I'm aware of out there that has a complementary USB port in addition to seven 680 milliamp at 9 volt uh, power outlets. Super cool. The sophisticated programming and the lack of consistency and sensitivity in the Macmillan eventually started to turn me off a little bit. And I started to look for other easy options that would give me the power and control I wanted, but that wouldn't increase my footprint very much. In other words, something that I could just throw into my backpack or my gym bag like I could the Macmillan and wouldn't increase my footprint very much or force me to get. So I settled on the Morningstar MC6 Mark II. Now this company based in Singapore is really doing some unbelievably great work and this is kind of the main product that they've developed. One thing I love about it right off the bat is its beautiful steel casing and its giant screen which allows you to really see what's going on with each of these 
uh, buttons as opposed to the four character light on the Keith McMillan which isn't as many characters as I would like and is off way at the end of the pedal. So it can be a little bit difficult to see where you're at. The Morningstar has MIDI in and MIDI out functionality, which meant that if I ever wanted to add the Macmillan to the Morningstar to have all kinds of control, I could easily do that. It also has two expression pedal jacks as opposed to the single expression pedal on the Keith McMillan, which would let me use any of the mini expression pedals out there. I'm using the Dunlop X-Mini um, to have really finite control over volume, wah, um, or any other expression parameter I wanted. After trying to use the Macmillan to do that, I started to get a little bit frustrated just with the lack of control and sensitivity and wanted something that felt like a pedal again. The Morningstar also has probably the best MIDI user software I've ever seen. It was incredibly easy to use, dial in new sounds, and what also sets this Morningstar aside is that it also had multi-functionality for each of the buttons. In other words, for my Arco, I simply press letter A once. Then, when I want to go to Arco Boost, I press A twice. Then, when I want to go to Pizzicato, I hold A down. Then, when I want to go to Pizzicato Boost, I do a double hold. So I push it down, I do a double tap, and then hold the second one. This allowed me to get so many different presets out of an incredibly small amount of real estate that my foot could easily fit on while providing a screen that was big and bright and descriptive in the live situations. I really am convinced that this is the most powerful, easy to use, best thought out MIDI controller on the market today. Assuming you need or are actually using more than 10 sounds on stage, which for 98% of you that won't be the case. I also keep the Morningstar right on the floor next to my rig, which meant that I needed to have a loose MIDI and power cable every time I plugged it in, which was a slight inconvenience, but nothing worth bitching about too much. My only real caveat with the unit is the height of it. It's probably a solid inch and a half tall, but then when you get to the back switches, you're really getting up there with your foot, which is why I assigned most of my everyday sounds to the first three bottom switches, which are soft switches and relatively quiet, which I really appreciated. Unfortunately, when you get to mounting something this tall on a pedal board, even with the one inch pedal train, well, maybe one inch and change with the rubber feet that come with the unit, pushing these switches can start to get a little bit tall and uncomfortable. So I already knew that if I was gonna add effects and expand my board for some reason and wanted to mount this, I was gonna need a board that was exceptionally flat and low to the ground, at least in the front row, so that I could still use this morning star and not be too uncomfortable. And sure enough, after a while, I started to become more and more dissatisfied with some of the sounds I was getting out of the Helix, particularly the reverb and the delay sounds. Now, if you look on the guitar form, some guitars rave about them, but I found them to be a little bit dull and uninspiring, and I wanted something more, especially as this was a core aspect of what I was doing with a lot of my groups. I knew that upping my reverb or delay game was going to mean adding more pedals, which meant getting a completely different board and rethinking how I was laying all of this stuff out. So that's what I did. And I'm gonna show you and give you some of the principles that went into that in the next video. So we'll see you over there.